I called and emailed the Nanaimo Detachment of the RCMP to request an interview about Lisa Marie Young's case on September 23, 2019. My first conversation over the phone is with Constable Gary O'Brien, the detachment's media relations officer. He is both professional and cordial. He tells me they will give it some consideration. Time goes by. I don't hear back. I follow up regularly. And later that fall, I receive an email from Constable O'Brien in response to me once again following up on that initial request. It reads, Hi, Laura. I spoke with the investigators, and they are not interested in pursuing the podcast. Gary. But now, fast forward. June 18th, 2020. Almost nine months since that no something has changed. In the episode you're about to hear, both Constable Gary O'Brien and the lead investigator on Lisa Marie Young's case finally talked to me. I don't believe that would have happened without the substantial amount of interest in this podcast. So thank you to the tens of thousands of you who subscribed and downloaded and listened. Thank you for caring about Lisa Marie Young. Your attention helped the police see a value in speaking to me. And here's something else I would say to any young journalist listening. If a source says no to an interview, don't assume that's the end of the story. Be creative, be persistent. Sometimes it pays off. I'm Laura Palmer. You're listening to Where's Lisa? Season one of my new true crime podcast, Island Crime. I worked in a big city newsroom for more than 25 years, and now I'm digging into stories I didn't have time to tell. This is Episode 8, The RCMP Break Their Silence. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police are Canada's national police force. We call them the Mounties. It's 2020, and like police forces everywhere, the Mounties are under pressure to improve relationships with the communities they serve. There have been large public demonstrations in response to the treatment of Indigenous people and Black Lives Matter as well. There are calls to defund the RCMP. In the interview you are about to hear, Corporal Muntiner will make the point that they can't do their jobs without the support of the community. And so this interview, coming as it does now in the heat of a battle for hearts and minds, may also be something of a public relations exercise. I get that. But I am still sincerely grateful for the chance to speak with these police officers. When at long last, I finally get a yes to an interview, I'm quick to schedule a time and race to Nanaimo. While I'm outside the detachment, a woman arrives with a flat of Tim Horton's donuts. She is here to thank the police for their assistance in finding some missing keys. While shopping for a baby gift recently, I encountered an old woman knitting small dolls shaped like Mounties. These are reminders to me that many people still see the Mounties as beloved Canadian icons, as heroes and protectors. But some of you listening will have a deep mistrust of police. Some of you will trust journalists like me even less. So over to you to listen and judge for yourself in this first in-depth interview with two of the police officers involved in Lisa Marie Young's case. It's Constable Gary O'Brien who comes down to meet me at the entrance of the detachment. We have never met in person before. For a second, I don't recognize him. His signature mustache is gone. He tells me it's his new pandemic look. He's in uniform, fit, tanned, energetic for a man who is a veteran with the force. Constable O'Brien escorts me upstairs through a maze of grey, dull offices to a boardroom. We are joined by Corporal Muntner, the lead on Lisa's case. He is the younger of the two, 
thin, serious. He has a stack of notes. I want to make the most of my time, and we get down to business quickly. Corporal Muntner will do most of the speaking in the interview, but it is Constable O'Brien who takes the lead at the start, beginning on a surprisingly personal note. I actually knew Lisa. I was friends with her and her friends. My wife and I would spend some time with them. We got to know Lisa back in about 1999. Young, vivacious girl, heading out on her own. Uh, I was actually contacted by one of her good friends several days after she went missing. Very concerned. And I did what anybody would. I was on days off. I called the office. And at that point, the investigation had commenced. So can you just say that uh, ag- again for me? You, you are, uh, are you a police officer at that point? So this is all going back almost 20 years. You, how did you know Lisa? I was a police officer. I was doing general duty work and I was on days off. And my wife and I were friends with a woman who knew her very well. And Lisa and her friends would come over and spend time in their backyard and we'd hang out. And, uh, and I had a, a good reaction to Lisa. She's just a nice young lady. Uh, I, I, I saw nothing untoward about her. She's just a, a nice girl, very quiet, very unassuming. And about two days after she went missing, her good friend called me on my days off. And they were very concerned. They knew that Lisa was starting a new job. She was out that evening. They'd been texting her or calling her nonstop, no response, very concerned. So I did like any person would as a police officer as well. I called our office, spoke with the investigators. And at that point, the investigation was well into the first or second day. And I left it at that. Okay. And so, you you know, you briefly sort of described what she was like, but I, I, you know, when I'm talking to anyone who knew her, I'm so keen to hear more about uh, your impressions of her. Can you just tell me a little bit more? Lisa was quiet. Uh, She didn't smile a lot. Uh, The picture that circulates with Lisa is exactly how I remember her. And uh, we shared some good times. Like she would join in the conversation. She shared her thoughts about starting a new job. Uh, She didn't talk much about boys, but we knew that she liked to go out and party with her friends. She had a wide variety of friends in the community. And that's why her friends, when her friend called me, she was so upset because she knew that Lisa was very responsible. She, she was starting a new job. She wasn't showing up. She wasn't responding to the phone calls, which was out of character for her. Very troubling. And I sensed the trepidation in her friend's voice. And that's why I called the office. And as we said, the investigation had begun. Okay. So same question for you. Can you again just say your name and what your relationship is to Lisa Marie Young's case right now? Sure. It's uh, it's it's Marcus Muntiner. Um, I'm a corporal in the Serious Crime Unit at Nanaimo Detachment, and I'm the primary investigator that's uh, coordinating the investigation into Lisa's disappearance. And um, I'm somewhat new to the island, as um, I didn't grow up here, like or haven't worked here as much as, as Gary, for instance. But um, I've of uh, about 18 years service. I've worked in major crime for most of my service. I've worked in a cold case unit in Surrey Detachment where I worked before. And uh, it's a type of work that I really enjoy. Um, I find it rewarding. And um, and I've had some some successes in the past on, on some cases there. So it's something that I'm passionate about. And um, yeah, it's something that really is a rewarding part of policing for me. I, I should add, so it, it's interesting how life evolves because at that time the investigation had begun. I was not part of the investigation. So but in, so in 2009, I took on the role of the media relations officer and I started speaking on behalf of this investigation. Marcus and the other investigators would prepare news releases and I would present them and then be asked questions. And I I took a vested interest because I had that prior relationship with Lisa. My wife and I would often attend the vigils. We'd go in the marches. We got to know Joanne. We got to know Dawn. We stayed in contact with her good friends. And it was nice to have that community connection also as a police officer and as a human being. 
I'm told that Lisa Marie Young's case uh, holds um, what? That, that there are people here who feel like a great attachment to her case and that maybe while they're all important, this one holds somewhat of a special place here for the detachment. Could you, uh, either one of you or both of you speak to that for me? Sure. I mean, I can talk about it as the, as the one that's sort of leading the investigative team, I guess. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's the case of this detachment that really, um, is one that everyone wa- you know, wants to work on, wants to try and find closure for, um, you know, Lisa's pictures, on the back of my notebook, um, you know, her, her pictures up in our, in our unit, there's, you know, some butterfly wings that her mom gave one of the previous investigators for the file that I think someone made, um, at one of the, uh, vigils that they had. So, um, and I know I, I recall when I joined the serious crime unit two years ago and sort of took over this case, um, the previous, one of the previous investigators that was, um, I think she was leaving on maternity leave, but she was very, she, she spent a lot of time talking to me about the case and you could tell she was passionate about it and really wanted to, she wanted to make sure when she was passing the torch off, off to me to continue with the file that um, she wanted to convey her passion for the file and her desire for there to be a resolution for it. So it was, you could tell right from that, from that get-go of that transfer of the file sort of to the team that's working on it now that um, there was a historic passion to work on this case. Why do you think that is? It, it's scary. We're all, the community is impacted by it because we all have children. We have daughters, we have sons. And she went missing. And everybody said, well, if it could happen to her, it could happen to somebody else. And at that time, we didn't have any other situations comparable to it. And as time progressed, the investigation continued, and people were thinking, well, well, we'll find out what happened. But we never did. And that's what's troubling. So this is the part of the interview where I'm going to ask you as much as you can to walk me through what you now know about the time leading up to Lisa going missing and that night itself. So a lot has been written, a lot has been said. And uh, so as much as possible, I think to try and put the facts out there uh, as we know them, I think would be helpful. All I can really talk about is that um, there is a lot of information that's out in the public and that, um, unfortunately, I think it's, it hurts our investigation to have that much information out. Um, it makes it challenging from an investigative point of view when we do get witnesses that come forward with things. Um, it's difficult then to be able to vet out whether those witnesses are, are just regurgitating things that are in the public domain, whether it's you know things that they know from personal knowledge and that kind of stuff. So um, it's not something that is normal from my experience for other investigations, not just historic ones, that there is a lot of information out there. So um, I think what we can help maybe confirm is that basically there's the police have a lot of information about where Lisa was that night leading up to the point that she is last seen in a car leaving with an individual who, who we have identified. Um, and it's that period after that, that there's very little information. Um, and we believe based on, you know, our investigation that there are people out there in the community that, um, know something about, about that period after, um, she was last seen and, you know, the passage of time might, work in our favor now you know um people's lives have changed people's circumstances have changed they may have they may have kids of their own Um, they may have been in a lifestyle at the time that you know they didn't have maybe have a good relationship with the police they didn't feel comfortable and maybe that's changed now and they're willing to come forward and and um, mention something to us or provide us with information that they think is relevant so our hope is that um people will come forward 
um, and tell us what they know. And, you know, the investigative team is, is there to follow the evidence. We're going to, we're going to follow down every lead we can and try and see where it takes us. You know, I get that there's obviously things you can't talk about, but can we just, um, to a certain extent, talk about the early part of the investigation and then move forward in time to where we're at now. When did the RCMP get the first call that she was missing? We received a call from the family the very first day that she was last seen, so the 30th of June. So um, I know there previously had been some information out there that that may not have been the case, but we did get a call from the family right away. Um, And there was a missing person investigation that was opened later that day. And the call uh, that she makes to Dallas Hulley, how quickly do the police know about that call in those circumstances? It took some time, right? Um, you know, based on the circumstances that we're aware of, um, you know, she's last seen leaving in a vehicle with a person that she'd never met. Um, the people that she was with that night, as far as we're aware, weren't necessarily close friends. Um, they were, you know, people that um, wouldn't necessarily have been aware of what other plans she had going on later that day or anything like that. So it took us a bit of time to track down um, those people and to, um, you know, identify that vehicle. And, you know, kudos to the original investigators for being able to do that um, and being able to track that down. The early newspaper reports quote the officers at the time as saying they don't have any reason to to suspect foul play. Do you have any thoughts on why that would be? Yeah, that's a good question. I think looking at it in hindsight, that that is just a standard line that's kind of said. Um, You know, the police generally don't like laying our cards on the table when we're investigating something. Um, It's important and we don't want to instill fear in the public unnecessarily too in certain cases. So, you know, it took some time for police to really establish that this was um, something that was more than just the family having some concerns and some, some concerning things that were identified early on, but still, when we're talking about foul play and being concerned about that aspect of it, there has to be some more, more information that the police would have before they can make that kind of a statement. And I think they were just, in hindsight, I think they were just being cautious. So at what point then does that change and why? Well, I think it changes simply because as invest, as information comes in on the investigation, you know, like we've talked about, um, it becomes clear that this is out of character. This is not normal circumstances and in the nature of, of the way she was last seen, right? In the company of a person that um, she had just met that night and and basically was, was not seen again at that point in time. So that obviously significantly changed the direction of the file. Once there is, you know, serious concern that she's in danger, um, how does the scope of the investigation uh, take shape at that point? What what happens? Well, the, the serious crime team um, at the detachment took over custody of that investigation very early on. Um, and the, my understanding is the serious crime team then is similar to it is today in the sense that they deal, they'll deal with all the types of investigations that are um, potentially, you know, could be a homicide or those types of files. So their engagement in that file early on to me is an indication of how serious they took it and how concerned they were of of where this could go. So I did make some, pulled some stats about our our investigation to give people a sense of of how much much work's been done on it. So, um, you know, there's over a thousand tasks that um, have been worked on and are being worked on on the file. There's over 15,000 documents. Um, there's two filing cabinets full of um, 
of paper documentation, which really is, is mainly <coughs> comprised of the original, you know, paper investigation, because obviously now we're, we're mostly electronic, you know, more than 250, you know, witness statements. So that's just to provide sort of a, a snapshot of the amount of work that's gone into the file and is actively ongoing um, today. So when you say a thousand tasks, what does that mean? We use a major case management type of organization. So it's a way of, it's a way for the police to keep a file organized and um, documented in a way that makes it easy to, to review and, and follow up with certain things and keep track of everything that's going on, especially, you know, investigation that gets larger and more complex and, and goes on for many years, it becomes very difficult to keep track of everything if it's not properly organized. So, um, Tasks can comprise, you know, um, you know, an interview of a witness or, you know, a review of an address or, um, you know, a tip that would come in or something like that. Well, essentially, it'll get assigned a task and then, um, you know, it might be given a priority. It might be given an, a, um, an investigator to follow up with. And then, you know, once that sort of task is investigated to its conclusion, in a sense, it'll get concluded. Um, and then, you know, as another one comes in, it'll just, it'll just keeps building. So it's kind of a cumulative thing. So obviously there's not a thousand outstanding tasks. A lot of those tasks have been followed up with to their end basically. But, you know, as the file continues, those tasks will continue to grow. Um, I imagine one of those tasks uh, might've been having to do with Lisa Marie Young's cell phone and uh, many of the questions I've got from people since I put the podcast out there in the world is what, whatever happened with her cell phone? You know, we, I guess we, people watch CSI and think about, you know, cell phone towers and things pinging and, and just, so can you at all speak to, uh, that the cell phone, what, what evidence was there, was there, a a trail from a service provider or how does that work? Well, I mean, that's an, an area that we would have, that we did look at. Um, I know that cell phones weren't as advanced in 2002 as they are now. I know we consider a cell phone an integral part of our life now. And there's certainly way more technology wise that can get done with cell phones currently. And, and really nowadays people use them as for everything, whether it's surfing the internet and, and social media, which obviously at that time wasn't wasn't in use, so um, it's something the police have. I can't get into the details about what we know about it, but it's important. It's an important part of a file. It's valuable in corroborating statements and other things like that. Um, but it would be different in today's world in terms of the type of things that we could could get from a cell phone nowadays. Right. Uh, you mentioned as well that uh, obviously the identity of the fellow driving the vehicle that Lisa Marie was last seen in was made. At what point did that happen? You know, I don't have the exact date, but it was very early in the investigation. So, um, and like I kind of mentioned at the beginning, I think just from a person looking at the investigation now at this time later, it was... It was a significant advancement in that in that file to be able to do that, right? Um, you know, the police had to get lucky a little bit, and there was some hard work done to try and identify that vehicle in person. Um, you know, I think Gary and I were talking before, and we discussed the, you know, if certain things had been different or the vehicle descriptors had been different, and other things, you know, there may have been less of a chance for for us to be able to identify that. So that has been a helpful thing for our file. And he, he is at some point uh, brought in for questioning, is that right? The police have talked to him. Yeah, I can't talk about sort of what we learned from that, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, he's a person of interest in our file and we, we talked to him, but that's, I guess, all I can disclose from our file, yeah. Okay, so there is, uh, as you know, a story out there about um, Joanne being involved in that interview with him 
Can you confirm that that happened? Yeah, I can confirm that that happened. And and what what is the what is the thinking there? I you know I've just I don't I'm not familiar with that happening, so I'm just curious what what is the thinking in doing that? Yeah, I mean I can't speak to what the investigators are thinking about you know specifically using her and having her attend for the interview, but I can just speak in in general terms, and I think I think someone else on the podcast that you talked to before kind of mentioned that as well, that, you know, the police use um, statements or audio from family members or witnesses or other people um, in the course of an investigation to, to try and assist them in, you know, in appealing to a person's emotions and, and, and feelings to try and, and have them tell us what, you know, what they know about something. So um, I think the investigators at the time were hopeful that Joanne could do that for them. Uh, so the family members I spoke with did identify that driver as Christopher Adair. I couldn't find in like going back through any of the stories I read, the police actually identifying him publicly. D has that happened? No, I don't think it has. And and so can you confirm he was the driver? I can't confirm that. I mean, no one's been charged with anything, so we're not going to con confirm any names, except that, you know, we talked to the driver and, and that's about it. Um, I don't know how um, certain things that are out in the public domain got out in the public domain. Um, and that's like we talked about early on. That's you know that's a factor. That's it's not a, a positive thing for our investigation for sure. What what about the car itself? Uh, I think Don Young told me it was his understanding that the vehicle was brought in and that there was uh, a search done. Can you confirm that aspect? Yeah, I don't want to confirm what kind of searches we did. Um, just, I think it's important for us to keep that as part of the investigation. Yeah, this this again may be something you folks are not comfortable uh, talking about, but I will ask. Uh, Don uh, did say that the family of the driver put pressure, his understanding, on the police, and that directly threatened their family with um, legal action. Is that something you're familiar with? I'm not aware of any specific pressure being put on anything. I know, just speaking in general terms from my experience with other investigations, you know, the police's job is to be neutral and impartial and on, and our job is to, to solve a case and, and bring justice to the victims. Um, so I can't see how that would impact an investigation. You know, um, sometimes, sometimes people say things whether it is family of, of um, people that are being investigated. Um, but it's not going to, in my, in my experience, it hasn't impacted the investigation. I want to ask you about um, the searches for Lisa Marie herself. Can you talk to me? You talked about, uh, you know, the number of tasks. Uh, at what point do the RCMP do a search for Lisa? There's been a lot of searches done um, and we continue to do them as information and things come in. So, um, you know, I can't be specific about places or, or times and that kind of thing, but it is something that we as investigators are continuing to do and will continue to do, whether it's um, through new information that we get or, or re-examination of, you know, of old information. So... So, so there have been there have been more than one search. Then has there been anything recently? Um, yeah, I mean, I can say that within since the time I've taken over the file, we have done done searches, and we will continue to do more. The psychic I spoke with talked about finding a bag of identification, including some female identification. And uh, 
again, this is one of those things that I have had questions from listeners just wondering what became of that. Does that, did you guys hear anything about that? Yeah, it was actually interesting when I was listening to one of the episodes yesterday, I heard that on there and I'm not aware of that um, at all. So, um, but, you know, from, from our perspective, from the, from the investigative perspective, we're open to, to explore, you know, all avenues. Um, You know, we haven't, there's no, we're not tunnel vision on a specific course. If there's, um, we're f- going to follow the evidence and if there's other avenues that we need to explore and other alternative, um, things that could have happened, we're, we're going to explore all those and follow where that evidence takes us. This is sort of heading into the territory of just seeing if there are things that are out there, uh, in terms of rumor that you can confirm or clarify. And again, if it's evidence that you can't talk about, I, I, I do appreciate that. Um, Lisa's father, Don Young, did talk to me about how uh, just days into Lisa being missing, he's approached by a gentleman who offers his assistance, but Don has a feeling that really he's just trying to find out information. Um, This man's name is and I'm wondering if you can talk to me at all about him or any connection he might have with this. Yeah, I mean, I can't confirm, you know, any specific person for our investigative file, but I'll, I'll simply just say it goes back to kind of what I said just before that, that we're open to all um, possibilities for the investigation. And we know that there's people have come forward or may have provided information to the police through various means. Um, and really, I think it's important if, if people haven't heard back from us or they never, you know, where they weren't sure whether the police received the information that they provided, that it's important they come forward now um, and come to us directly and and provide us that information in, in, in person and give us the ability to follow up with it and and follow that information wherever it takes us. The RCMP is just one part of the justice system. Um, there are others. And I guess I'm just trying to get a sense of what role some of the other parts of the organization might have played. Was a case ever submitted to the Crown Prosecutor's Office for approval? No. No. So, okay. Uh, Were any warrants ever... uh, Did you ever get any warrants related to this case? The police have used many different techniques um, throughout the course of the investigation and Some of those um, have included getting warrants, and we will continue to use whatever techniques we have at our disposal to try and and pursue this file. There have been um, persistent rumors about Hell's Angels' involvement. Can you speak to that at all? I can't. I can't confirm that either way, yeah. Uh, And, of course... A number of people have, um, for some reason, a belief that there is a video that was made that night. Is that something you have any knowledge of? The police don't have any kind of video. So if there is someone out there that has that video or it has a video, um, encourage them to give us a call. Uh, there is a call made to the family at some point from a woman claiming that Lisa Marie, her body is being moved. And that is, again, one of those um, rumors out there in the community that seems to be widely um, believed. What do you know about that? I'm not aware of that specific call taking place. Um, But I, I know there's a lot of things like that in the community where there's rumors about you know, bodies getting moved and people, you know, her being buried here or being buried there. And it's, I know from talking to the family, it's, it's hard for them even now. They're, they're trying to do their best to, to funnel witnesses towards our investigative team. Um, Especially in the age of social media now, they're getting inundated with people saying they have information or they, and are, you know, sometimes providing them allegedly grisly details of things and it's it's really hard on them so i guess 
I just go back to encouraging people to come come to us and talk to us and then let us use that information in conjunction with everything else we know and we'll we'll do what we can. I had uh, a couple of different people tell me that various police over the years told them, you know who is responsible, you just haven't been able to prove it. Is, is that true? I don't know if, I mean, I don't know if other police officers have been saying that, but I guess I can just talk about the investigative team as it stands now and our objectives. Um, we're not laser focused on any specific person or individuals or persons. So um, our job is to follow the evidence and we're going to follow that wherever it takes us. Um, even if it's different from the early part of the investigation or, or not. So we're open to um, open to whatever information people have um, that we can follow up with and corroborate and, and, and build from there. So we're not, we're not focused on one specific person or persons. Do you, do you know where Christopher Adair is now? I can't comment on that. Yeah. Okay. Um, many of the people I spoke with s expressed some fear uh, about talking, about um, coming to the police. Mm -hmm. uh, why do you think there still is, 18 years on, that kind of fear in the community? Yeah, that's a good question. It's something we have as, as investigators have talked about as well to try and understand where that fear comes from. Um, you know, I'm not here to judge people on what they're fearful of or not fearful of, but, you know, 18 years is a long time to still be fearful about something. Um, and I know even from personal experience that fear sometimes is not always based on reality and fact. Um, and sometimes people use fear as a, as a mechanism to stop people from talking and stop people from coming forward. So, and I would just encourage people to, to consider that. I do feel like, you know, it's 2020, we're at where we are now. Um, and I wonder if you can reflect at all on, given what we learned from the Murdered and Missing Women's Inquiry, to what extent do you think um, unconscious bias, systemic racism played a role, particularly in the early part of the investigation? I don't think it played any role at all, based on everything I know about the file and the amount of work that's been done on it. Um, has you know, investigative standards changed since that time? Yes. Has how the police deal with missing persons files change significantly for sure. Um, you know, I'm the missing person coordinator for the detachment, you know, and that's something that that's a position that didn't exist in 2002. Um, there's a significant amount of supervisory oversight for missing persons now. Um, what has changed? What are we, what are we doing better now than we were 18 years ago? Right. So <clears throat> for missing persons files, Specifically, I mean, there's risk assessments that's done on the onset of a missing person file um, that gets reviewed by a supervisor that dictates sort of how that file is prioritized. Um, the file is passed on from watch to watch to watch. So there's 24 seven work being done on that file, you know, an investigator doesn't go off shift and the file sits for a week or something like that, right? It's, it's dealt with every shift. There's the, you know, the supervisor or the watch commander, if it stays with patrol, right, for instance, is, is monitoring that. And it's, it, they, you know, it's mentioned at briefings. It goes on. Um, there's a missing persons unit in headquarters that at certain points as the, the days go on and the missing hasn't been located, they 
go on and review that file. They put recommendations on the file. There's a missing persons coordinator like myself and I'll go in and there and review every single missing person file. Um, so it's a way for, for there to be a lot of oversight and for files that do appear suspicious or concerning from an early stage, they can get um, the, the attention that they need early on. And, and it makes sure that files don't sort of, you know, fall off the, the end of a desk, you know, as a, for an analogy's sake, right? Um, so it's significantly different than it was before. As this case and awareness of it has spread outside the community, I do see people occasionally commenting online, like, how do people know for sure that she is not alive? Um, is there any doubt at all in your mind that uh, she is, in fact, uh, dead? Based on everything we know of our file, my belief is that she's not, not alive anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, I'd, I'd like to ask you both a question that I've asked um, pretty much everyone I've interviewed, which is, you know, it, there's a possibility people will listen and who knows something. Uh, what do you want them to know? What do you want them to hear? Like speaking directly to somebody who might have information, what would you say to them? There's no reason to not provide information at this point. 18 years have passed. Some people may have been fearful because of the situation they were in at that point. Often fear is not based on fear itself. It's based on something of their own reality. We know there are people who have information that can move this investigation forward, even after 18 years. We need to hear from them. They can't wait any longer. There's people who have moved from Nanaimo. They're elsewhere. They have to share this. They have to listen to this podcast and do the right thing and talk. They don't have to necessarily talk to us. Contact the local police department, whoever it is, but make sure that we get that information because we owe it to the family. Yeah, I think I would just say you know, exactly what Gary just said, but also, you know, don't assume that the police know that inf piece of information already or that someone else has already told them or, um, you know, I'd rather someone call me with something and for me to be able to say, yeah, thank you very much. We, you know, we do are aware of this or, or whatever, but I'd rather they do that than not call us at all. Um, so especially on a file that's this old and a lot of people believe other people may have said something or, you know, I've seen it in other investigations where if you have four people that witness something and two witnesses come forward, the other two sort of sort of think, well, the other two already talked, so we don't have to worry about it. So really for us to make, to make this puzzle, I'll use that analogy and put all the pieces together, uh, we need every single person that has any bit of information to come forward and I'll just add this, that people have come forward recently um, in our investigation that haven't talked to us before and have provided us, us with information um, that may have been fearful before and aren't to the point now and have come forward. So I would just say to anyone that's out there that feels that they would be the only one if they came forward and I, that they wouldn't be. They would be one among others that have stepped up to the plate and come forward and provided us with information. Uh, just as I've been listening to you and you talking about not having tunnel vision, uh, I guess I'm wondering, and maybe I'll just be specific and come right out, is there anything in the podcast, anything that I've put out there or anything that's like out there elsewhere that is wrong, that is taking the public uh, down a road that you have evidence to believe is just not right. I don't think so. I mean, at this point, at this point, we need to just explore um, 
all those avenues. And, you know, the challenge is when you receive, you know, second and third hand information, um, you know, A, it's a lot of work to go and track down the source of that information. Then you might be another step removed and you got to track down that source of that information. And then maybe it, you know, it becomes a dead end, right? But until you are able to follow those, all those um, avenues down to the point where you're able to, you know, comfortably say that, you know, it's an investigative avenue that is, is definitely doesn't go any further than that. Um, we're going to keep following those leads. And um, at this point, we're not close to any possibilities. I think that's all the questions I have at this point. Do you have any questions for me? Is there anything that I didn't ask or anything unsaid that you want to put out there? So if you want to show support, there's a vigil this June 28th, starts at 11 a.m. at our detachment, 303 Bordeaux Street, and we'll march down to Maffeo Sutton Park. That might just be what you need to see the grief that continues with the family and friends of Lisa Marie Young. Um, I think I'll just say I'm, I'm appreciative of your efforts on doing this podcast and the family's continued efforts and work that they're doing. Um, in trying to keep the public's attention on this file, um, encouraging people to come forward to talk to us. You know, we can't do our job if we don't have the public support, if we don't have witnesses that want to talk to us. And we need, we need those people to come forward for us to be able to, to push this file forward. I'm releasing this episode just ahead of the annual March for Justice for Lisa on Sunday, June 28, 2020. If you are in Nanaimo, please come out and support Lisa's friends and family. And if you aren't in Nanaimo, you can still show your support for Lisa. On June 30th, leave a light on for Lisa. Sign up for the new Facebook campaign in recognition of that night all those years ago, when Lisa's parents sat up waiting for their daughter to return. I'm keeping my light on for Lisa, and I hope you will too. And now, a request. Please take a moment to rate and review this podcast, and recommend it to your friends. And if you know a case on Vancouver Island you think merits a closer look, please let me know at laura at laurapalmer.ca. Island Crime Season 2 will be available in the months ahead. I'm Laura Palmer. This is Island Crime. Thank you for listening.